Today, we're starting a new series. We're calling it, We Are the Church. Now, over the last month, we've been reminded that God's church, and East Cross even more specifically, is not the building with the name on it. You and I are the church. Together, we're the church. We are to be God's people. We are God's children. We are followers of Jesus Christ. We are the church. So I want you to notice, if you will, this uh, blank wall behind me. Now, we've had some really good, some really nicely done backgrounds over the, the past couple of years since we've had our, our great screen, if you will. It's been awesome, but you know what? This is the best background yet. It really is. And, and, and uh, I, I want you to participate in making this the best background ever. Now, thanks to Chad for, for the idea. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Chad shared this video uh, of the Call family. They were worshiping online. It was a touching scene. In fact, here is, is a video, is a shot from that video, and you can see it there. There's the, there are the girls there watching the band worship, and, and they're worshiping with them. And so we want you to send, if you will, we want you to send a, a photo of you worshiping online to us so that we can uh, build our background from this one picture, continue to build our background each week on us being the church together. Even though we're socially distancing uh, at this time, we are the church together. So you can send that actually in an email to, or, or text it to, to Chad or Amy or myself. And I want to thank you for being a part of the church of Jesus Christ and East Cross with all of us together. In this series, I'm, I'm using the letters written by the Apostle Paul to the church at, at Corinth uh, to, to guide this series that admonishes us to be the church. Because like East Cross, the church at Corinth had some of the best people. I mean, they were great people, people who had grown in their faith. And as they listened to God's word, the Apostle Paul led them. And then by the time the, the letters were written to them, and that's First and Second Corinthians, uh, they had grown in size, but then they also had kind of lost some of the fervor for, for the gospel, for, for the good news. And some divisions had started to happen in their midst, and, and, and you know, they started becoming clear that there were divisions based on which leader different ones in the congregation followed and there seemed to be power struggles going on and you know between personalities and some different theological understandings and this division was serious and it can be seen uh, when you read first uh, and second corinthians it can be seen that there were at least four groups that claimed uh, to follow one christian leader over another as each were in competition with each other other divisions uh, occurred when, you know, because of, of bad moral behavior uh, in, the, in the church. A third division actually occurred over the seating at the Lord's table the, as they did it by social ranking and others felt that was wrong. A fourth division actually occurred over the importance of spiritual gifts, especially the gifts of tongues and prophecy. You know, were those with those gifts actually superior Christians to others? So as serious as these issues were, Paul saves the most important issue to the last. The belief in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the implications that this doctrine had for the church. See, what Paul saved for, for the last of his letter, we're going to actually start with today. Paul builds sound theology and doctrine for the believers at, at, at Corinth throughout this letter before going into it, I, I would call it the vastly important implications of the Christian faith. And it simply starts with, I want you to know this about the gospel, which I preached among you. And so he wants to assure the Corinthians that even with the issues that have arisen, which he has had to deal with, that they still are a part of God's family. Let's read uh, the first 11 verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says this, 
Brothers and sisters, I want to call your attention to the good news that I preach to you, which you had also received and in which you stand. You are being saved through it if you hold on to the message I preach to you unless somehow you believed it for nothing. I passed on to you as most important what I also received. Christ died for our sins in line with the scriptures. He was buried and he rose on the third day in line with the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas, now that's Peter, he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at once. Most of them are still alive to this day, though some have died. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me as if I were born at the wrong time. I'm the least important of the apostles. I don't deserve to be called an apostle because I harass God's church. I am what I am by God's grace, and God's grace hasn't been for nothing. In fact, I have worked harder than all the others. That is, it wasn't me, but the grace of God that is with me. So then, whether you heard the message from me or them, this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. Now, the Greek word that Paul uses to explain what he is sharing is norizo, which almost looks like originally a combination of the word for knowledge and the word for root. And you know, although it, it rightly means to cause to know, but root knowledge or foundation knowledge is really implied by what follows in, in this verse. And so the doctrine of the death, the burial, uh, and the resurrection is the foundation of the gospel. There can be no gospel besides it. You know, Paul literally gospels the gospel to them, it says in the verse. He preached the gospel. He gospeled the gospel to them. You know, it appears, gospel appears both as a noun and a verb there. The Corinthians had, had responded to Paul's proclamation of the gospel by accepting it. And this had happened earlier, and Paul goes on to say that the gospel gives the believers standing with God. It is the solid ground or the foundation upon which they stand. That's all in verse 1. Now, in verse 2, Paul starts adding to this, and he adds to this standing, this foundation, this core belief. That is, it is the means by which they are currently being saved. So this is a foundation that we want to get right. I mean, salvation is the free gift of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And he is the one who keeps us. Our part is to believe. Believe that Jesus was crucified, that he died, that he was buried, and then he resurrected from again to be alive even as he brings us to life. So we should examine what we believe by, by what follows in his letter. He gives us great examples here. Paul had taught them that, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried as the proof that he really died. It also says that Jesus rose on the third day according to the same scriptures. The scriptures of what we call the Old Testament actually is, is the first proof of, of Christ's atoning death as well as his resurrection. So see, at the beginning of his letter to the believers in Rome, Paul tells them about the gospel which was promised beforehand, something that was promised before it actually happened. Jesus on the road to Emmaus that we talked about last week in the sermon, that shows that opens up all the scripture. Jesus opens up all the scripture as he walks down the road to Emmaus with, with the disciples. And it shows that Christ must suffer these things and then he will rise again. So the proof of scripture comes first. God told it in advance so that when it actually happens, it would serve as proof. And we can understand that God is always good to his word. The witness of Jesus, or the witness of people, rather, who, who saw Jesus after he had risen 
serves as the second proof. First is what God says in the Old Testament. Second is the witness of people who saw Jesus after he had risen. And he serves this, they serve as the second proof. Now, Paul mentions that Cephas or, or, or Peter saw him. Now, we see in the Gospels that Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene and other, other women. And then Luke records of the appearance on the Emmaus Road. And, and then Jesus had shown himself apparently to Peter by the time the, the Emmaus Road disciples got back to Jerusalem. And then he appears to the twelve. And then on that night, and, and that's both recorded in, in the Gospels of Luke and John. And then he appears again to the twelve later on. And this time, uh, Thomas is with them. And, and this is recorded again in, in the Gospel of John. So there is also a mention that Jesus again meets with seven of the disciples, and I believe that's in, in John chapter 21. And, and then Matthew actually records, the Gospel of Matthew records a meeting in Galilee where the Great Commission was given. And, and I don't know, perhaps this maybe coincides with the 500 people at once that, that Paul records and talks about. Paul adds another meeting with James, the brother of, of the Lord of Jesus, who had been an unbeliever before. Uh, and what is important is that during the 40 days between Easter and Pentecost, there are many appearances. During this time, the resurrection and, and what happens later, there are a lot of appearances that take place. They ate with Jesus. They, they heard his voice. They saw him with their eyes. They touched him. They, they proclaimed Jesus. They claimed, they proclaimed that Christ had risen indeed. Now, Paul does not mention all of these, of course. Uh, it, it, but what Paul does present, first of all, it, it, the quality of the witnesses. I mean, these are, are apostles who had run to begin with when, when they, Jesus was arrested. And, and especially Peter, when he denied uh, Jesus. And, and all of these things had changed. They had changed. Their hearts had changed when they had saw Jesus, when he appeared to them, they now become bold proclaimers of faith. They're willing to die for Jesus, and they were certain of his resurrection. In addition to this is that there was a number of witnesses, over 500 of them at one time. And Paul says most of them were still living. You know, a few had died, but most of them were still living. And, you know, 500 people could not have shared the common delusion about Christ's resurrection. You know, one or two people overcome with grief, maybe they could do that and, and you know, that he was raised, but all 500? See, that's far too many. Now, they would all agree on what we saw or they saw. And, and James, the brother of Jesus as well, as his, as, as his brothers and Mary, were certain that Jesus was out of his mind if you read through the Gospels, and, and they were going to put him away in, in private from the crowd. And, and John explicitly, explicitly tells us that Jesus' brothers did not believe him, did not believe in him. My, how things have changed from the time of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to now, after his resurrection. It is these two groups of witnesses that Paul mentions to help assure that the Corinthians, the church there that he had started, of the foundation of their faith. And he then goes on to mention one more witness. This witness is, is important to Paul because it's Paul himself. Now, now, Paul is very humble about this, but, but he also was very sincere. The Corinthians could remember actually, the troubles that, that Paul had suffered from the hands of the other Jews in Corinth and, and how Paul had remained unwavering in his zeal for Jesus Christ. And I know he certainly related to them the circumstances of how Jesus had come to him, appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Saul, who is now Paul, by the way, this is Paul, was, was, was in that sense on that road to Damascus, resurrected to life in the light of Jesus' resurrection. It was a life of believing in. It was a life of following and a life of teaching others about Jesus Christ. The one who was the most zealous persecutor 
of the followers of Jesus has now become the boldest advocate and most passionate follower of Jesus Christ. We know that some of the Corinthians knew well about Peter, but they had personally seen the work of Paul. I mean, they had seen the fresh wounds on his back when he had uh, come from, from Philippi, which had been just a recent thing where they had beat him. And, and not long before that, uh, Paul had been stoned. And he was uh, left for what they thought was dead at Lystra. And, and to be stoned actually means they would use smaller stones and throw them. And when a person falls down and can no longer protect themselves, they would take larger stones and smash the skull. He was stoned and left for dead in Lystra. He says that to the Galatians in his letter to them that, that he bore the wounds of Christ in his body, which all could see. The thing about Paul was that he was tireless in his attending to, his serving, and in his leading the, the Corinthian church. Yeah, he, spent, he was able to spend a whole year and a half with them at the beginning of the church time, teaching them and evangelizing them. And, and also during this time, he was also having to work as a, a tent maker to support himself. And this personal witness was very much an important witness that Jesus Christ was alive. So as we come to this second Sunday in Easter of Easter, we live in a community of Jesus Christ called the church. You know, the name we've chosen for ourselves in this congregation is East Cross. And you know, we, we suffer from what we call the human condition and, and the tendency, tendencies to, to sin. You know, our, our congregation, like every other congregation, is not free from problems. But we do have a great church. You know, but we, we still have to deal with issues from time to time in our own lives. And until the day the Lord returns, we'll still continue to have to deal with issues and sins as they come up. I mean, you know, we, we still have our, our favorite uh, preachers. And we still have our favorite musicians. We still have our favorite forms of worship that we're so sure, or, or styles of worship that we're sure must also be God's favorite. We have some doctrinal differences. And some of these are very important. Others are not so important. And it seems like the less important ones are the ones that produce, produce the most heat when we clash on them. But here's the thing vastly more important than our differences, way more important than any of our differences, is the common confession, the common confession that Jesus Christ truly died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day. And this is the common confession of our creed. We have a mission to proclaim the risen Lord to the nations. And in our proclamation of resurrection comes the truth of crucifixion and the cross. You know, really, at the, at the first of this letter, uh, back in the very first chapter, the 18th verse, Paul says this to the people starting out. He says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed. But it is power. It is the power of God for those who are being saved. So we need to be grounded in the promise of Scripture. We desperately need to be grounded in the promise of Scripture. This means we need to know both the Old and the New Testaments. And I'm not talking about just a few proof texts uh, to, to prove our point. I'm talking about we need to be sure, as sure as the apostles finally were, so that we as well might be bold uh, proclaimers so that we can remain steadfast when our, our views and perhaps even our own selves, our lives are attacked. And here's what we're promised is that the, we will have the aid of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who brings the Scripture when we desperately need it. The Spirit also, also testifies to our spirit that we are God's children. We need to be reassured of this. 
And as we do, I was thinking of the hymn that we've been singing. We always sing at this time of the year. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. So be glad and rejoice in this, the most important truth, rather than focusing on the things that would separate us. Now, if for some reason you have yet to come to believe in the, in the foundational doctrine that Jesus truly died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again, I would urge you to consider receiving Christ, believing and receiving. He is, He is your only hope. He is. He's your only hope in this dark and this lonely world. And and so I want you to consider the evidence. Just consider what we've talked about. The evidence that Paul presents to the church. And then add to that the fact that the tomb is empty. That no one stole the body. Now they did have grave robbers in those days. but, But the tomb was guarded. So that could not happen. You know, no thief would unwrap a dead body in the tomb and neatly wrap up the strips of cloth and, and the napkin over his head because being caught stealing a dead body was a capital offense. They joined the ranks of the dead at that point. You see, Jews, Jesus truly died and was sealed in a tomb. The spear went through his heart. He was truly dead. And if the women could not roll away the stone, then how could a man who had been beaten by whips to within an inch of his life, who was too weak to even finish carrying his cross to Calvary, who was crucified and and, and then stabbed through the heart, how could he unwrap his own clotted grave cloths in which he was bound And roll away this huge, heavy stone. And something else. If Jesus had still been in the tomb, I promise you, the religious leaders would quickly end all this resurrection resurrection talk by producing the body. They would have done it in a heartbeat. Remember all the witnesses who saw him. After he rose, who saw him after he rose on several different occasions. Many witnesses saw him, time and again are talked about. They shared food with him, they touched him, they, they saw him ascend into heaven. And those who were so cowardly before and were afraid to stand up before boldly proclaimed then that Jesus was alive in the face of their own death. These witnesses suffered great things for the faith. And actually, and and you know something? The list of martyrs for the faith in Jesus Christ goes on for 2,000 years. 2,000 years. Even today in 2020, when, when our only focus seems to be coronavirus, in places like maybe North Korea, the Mideast, and there's numerous other places, People are still suffering for proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. And they're laying down their own lives as a testimony. And they have done this because they are sure, they are sure that Jesus is alive. Are you still, are you still not sure then pray to the Lord, pray to God that that he will confirm these facts to your soul and show you that Jesus is alive. Today, you can rise from the dead with Jesus and be assured of new life because it's written that if you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. What a great Glorious, special, beautiful promise.